Okay, dear everyone, welcome again to the inaugural lecture in the Sinophone Classicism lecture series. My name is Zhi Yang, professor of Sinology at Goethe University Frankfurt, the organizer of the series. I thank the Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften as well as the Wiener Heimatstiftung for providing financial, human, and technical support for the lecture series. I will introduce the concept of the lecture series and our distinguished speaker, Professor D David Dervé Wang, in a minute after the welcome speech by Professor Luz Bachmann, former vice president of Goethe University Frankfurt and director of the Forschungskolleg. Professor Luz Bachmann, please. Thank you, Professor Yang. I would like to welcome all of you. I'm very pleased that Professor David Wang is giving this inaugural lecture now uh, for the second time that we completed today. Um, I'm very happy that our institute, which is an institute uh, of advanced studies um, of the Goethe University and important uh, for Germany uh, and the Rhine-Main region, especially that we are able to host and to organize this whole event, since um, Professor Young is part of our uh, fellows, fellow community. And so uh, I am uh, the one to thank you all, including the staff of our house, and would like to ask Professor Young now to introduce Professor Wang to this wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Luzman, Luz Bachmann. So as the organizer of the lecture series, allow me to start with a short explanation of its concept. This lecture series is envisioned to be multi-annual, a long-term project that will last for multi multiple years. Every month in the winter or summer German semester, we will invite one scholar to present his or her newest research on a literary, cultural, or intellectual phenomenon related to what we call xenophone classicism. What does it mean? The Sinophone refers to all Sinaitic languages, including but not limited to Mandarin, Cantonese, Hakka, Hokkienese, to race, but a few most famous examples. The Sinophone community spreads across the world, including Europe. Sinophone classicism thus refers to articulations that evoke memories of China's classical past to serve local, contemporaneous, and vernacular needs of individuals and groups identified or self-identified as Chinese. Arguably, such articulations are gaining increasing currency in our globalized and digital era, an intriguing and at times paradoxical phenomenon that merits in-depth investigation. So today we are honored to have Professor David Derry Wang from Harvard University as our first speaker. In November, the famous poet Yang Lian will give a talk on his classicist poetic aesthetics. In December, the sociologist Marius Meinhof from Bielefeld will present on the popular discourse on filial piety in China. In January, Jerome de Cloyd from Amsterdam will give a presentation on the Chinese youth culture. In February, Marcus Nones from Michigan will investigate the use of calligraphy in Asian films. I hope to see all of you often in the future, perhaps even in person, as most of the talks will adopt the hybrid format. If you wish to come in person, please write us an email. A brief note on data privacy and technicality. As the lecture will be recorded, if you do not wish your image to appear in the recorded video even accidentally, please turn off your camera now. During the Q&A session, when you raise a question, we we'll wish that you could turn on your camera, but of course you don't have to. If you want to raise a question, please simply click the raise hand button on the bottom of the screen anytime during the lecture. I will call the names one by one after the lecture. There will be about 30 minutes for questions at the end. Now, it is my honor to finally introduce our distinguished guest, Professor David Derby Wang, who really needs no introduction. 
He was born in Taiwan in 1954 and graduated from National Taiwan University. He received a PhD in comparative literature from University of Wisconsin-Madison and taught in Columbia University before joining Harvard. He is currently Edward C. Henderson Professor of Chinese Literature and holds a joint appointment in comparative literature. He has published multiple monographs in English and dozens of books in Chinese. Listing these titles alone will take too much time, so I'm not going to do that. Through his prolific and insightful research, he has fundamentally shaped our discourse on Chinese and Taiwanese literary modernity. His recent research, however, increasingly guides our attention to the hybridity of the classical and the modern, such as the role of the classical Chinese lyric tradition in the epic times of the 20th century. His edited volume, A New Literary History of Modern China, published in 2017, is arguably the first time that a major history of modern Chinese literature pays equal attention to classical genres, a presence that has previously been obscured due to the progressivist ideology that dominates the historiography of Chinese modernity. Today, he will give a talk on the classicist poetry by the famous historian Chen Yingke, which, in Professor Wang's words, compels us to question the dialectic between modernity and monstrosity, the tenability of effective evocation, xin, and the latitude of creative freedom. Without further ado, Professor Wang, the proverbial floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Professor Yang and uh, Professor Luz Beckman. Thank you very much for your generous introduction. It is truly my honor and a pleasure uh, to be uh, with everybody um, at this um, very uh, beginning of the lecture series on classicism in modern and postmodern times, um, a, a new project launched by Frankfurt University. I have to apologize first for not being able to complete my lecture last time due to connection problems. Uh, I truly understand um, this was uh, a um, properly frustrating and sometimes unpleasant experience for some of you, but we will try again to complete the lecture today. So let me now switch to the mode of share screen in the hope that I could use some visual presentations to better address the uh, topic of today. First of all, uh, let me just um, add a couple of things that before my um, lecture. That is, um, I have modified the title of my lecture. Now it is titled A Story of the Red Seed, Classicism in a Modernist Crisis. I used a red seed instead of um, red bean so as to better address the botanical nature of um, the very specific um, topic I'm addressing, a kind of a, kind of a fruit or some kind of a seed uh, in association with the poetic invocation of um, um, a generation of Chinese uh, writers and the poets uh, writing at a difficult time. And I suppose I'm not the best person to uh, give this talk because my specialty is modernism and even postmodernism. My colleagues um, at Harvard, such as Professor Steve Owen, Professor Yi Li or Professor Xiaofei Tian probably are better candidates for uh, this type of topic. But I believe um, uh, I've been invited to give this inaugural uh, lecture mainly um, to, uh, to raise questions, to make observ observations in the hope that we can further open up our understanding um, of the mutual illumination between classicist literature and the modern literatures in different domains. So um, my question um, will uh, start with an observation. That is uh, for me, classicism literature constitutes one of the most contested topics in the millennial reappraisal of a modern Chinese literature. Ever since the modern period, the beginning of the modern period, the May 1st movement, modern Chinese literature has been a, um, based upon the understanding that um, highlights the vernacular tradition of um, language or literature. 
Western style genres, a progressive agenda predicated on revolution and enlightenment, and above all, an order to mimesis in the name of realism. Above all, modern is invoked in such a way as to celebrate whatever is deemed iconoclastic and new. By way of contrast, classes of style poetry and other genres such as prose, narrative, and so on and so forth, appears to be a perfect counterexample to such a paradigm. Its adherence to non-vernacular discourse, um, exercise of formalism, and its penchant for archaic motifs and imaginaries are all said to betray its uh, reactionary nature. In other words, um, classicism in general has been regarded as a, um, as a kind of reactionary um, representation of a Chinese modernity vis-a-vis -vis the May Force paradigm. Nevertheless, I wanted to argue that um, in historical hindsight, we come to realize that uh, classicism as a literary institution, a shared cultural memory and artistic expertise, and even a political platform continued to thrive throughout the 20th century, regardless of the predominant existence of a new literature. While it was adopted by conservatives to demonstrate their nostalgia, it found no less manifestation among radical anti-traditionalists from Lu Xun to even Mao Zedong. So classicist literature, particularly in the genre of a poetry, um, represents as much a token of a cultural necrophilia in Yu Dafu's words um, as a signal of a political avant-gardism um, in the case of um, figures such as Lu Xun, Guo Mo Ruo, and Mao Zedong. And more intriguingly, at selective moments of historical crisis, classicist style poetry appeared to best address the structure of a feeling of the time thus displaying its provocative power more than any form of a new literature. So this is a really a kind of a paradoxical reflection upon the dynamics of the so-called modernity of a modern literature. So my question include um, observations such as modern classicist poetry is a really a dynamic genre capable of engaging both the decadent in the progressive, both the lyrical and the epic inherent in modern literary sensibilities. And at its most polemical, the discourse and the practice of classicism compels one to raise the following question, whether the modern literature as we are dwelling on is the least modern of all Chinese modernities, if not the most conventional of all modern Chinese conventionalities. In other words, I feel um, when we are talking about uh, how modern, modern Chinese literature really is, we tend to overlook the fact some of the token modernist exercises are really not that avant-garde or that radical by the standard of world literature. And by contrast, classicist Chinese literature could actually present a totally different platform through which we engage with some of the most radical and the most iconoclastic issues. So below, I'm going to um, introduce the four examples for general discussion. And the four figures I would like to feature are Mao Zedong, needless to say, the most prominent political leader in 20th century China. Chen Yinke, arguably the greatest historian in 20th century China. And Nie Ganlu, a veteran leftist revolutionary who joined on the revolutionary work as early as late 1920s. And yet in the 1950s, he found himself uh, to become an anti-revolutionary at a really troubled time of China's um, uh, sort of uh, advance to post revolutionary modernity. And finally, um, the people, um, the crowd, Mao and his followers about to uh, rescue from the uh, from suppression and other um, um, circumstances in early modern China. 
So I will start um, the case of uh, 1958 when Chairman Mao uh, composed a, um, a, a, a poem, um, getting rid of the god of a plague. And this refers to the uh, triumphant uh, result of a kind of nationwide era um, eradication of uh, a, a, para a parasitic disease of um, a, a schizosomiasis. And the first two lines are certainly the most famous ones. Um, 春风杨柳万千条, 六亿神州尽顺摇, countless willow twigs are swaying in the spring's breeze. Six billion people in the divine land are all Yao's and the Shuns. Yao's and the Shuns refers to the names of uh, ancient Chinese sages. So Mao in 1958 was very complacent about the, uh, the circumstances um, he was uh, ruling and uh, definitely he was looking forward to a very prom promising and prosperous prospect of this new China. 1958, also coincided with the publication of um, the English translation of a Mao's classes of poems entitled 19 Poems. The title um, uh, is extremely suggestive if one is familiar with the, the tradition of a pre-modern Chinese poetry. It refers to 19 poems uh, composed in a uh, pre-Han dynasty and definitely uh, the resonation between the, uh, the current and the modern socialist leader and the soundings of a pre-modern uh, voices um, in um, the poetic department. I mean, these, uh, this kind of a resonance couldn't be clear enough, but definitely the content of those poems uh, has uh, undergone drastic transformation. I need to point out the fact that 1958 was also a year with much significance in the political domain of this new nation. At that time, Mao had just um, sort of finished his, um, his uh, movement of uh, an anti-rightist campaign. Hundreds and thousands of intellectuals um, uh, were uh, singled out for politically incorrect thoughts and critique. In the meantime, Mao launched the Great Leap Forward movement a movement that featured um, campaigns such as the Backyard Furnaces and the People's Commune. At that time, this definitely represented the one of the newest and the most modernist uh, in intervention with Chinese um, um, life uh, at large. Um, but in the next several years, we would see the, um, the disastrous outcome of such a kind of uh, massive um, um, movement. Um, so this is a really a time full of political and social turbulence, to say nothing of the fact that Mao wanted to uh, use this movement, the Great Leap Forward, to, I quote, stimulate uh, 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 the, uh, the, the public passion for surpassing the UK and um, truly uh, standing up uh, against the, the Soviet Union and uh, emulating the United States all imperial or imperialist powers for Mao. So if Mao by then had composed his uh, sort of emperor-like uh, poems to, um, to really um, um, spread uh, all his own poetic soundings uh, nationwide and even worldwide, at the same time, the Chinese people are said to have composed their own kind of uh, poems in the format of uh, folk songs in resonant with the chairman's um, poetic uh, compositions. Red Flag Songs was uh, published uh, in 1959, which featured more than 300 poems purportedly composed by the peasants and the workers all over China. And for many, um, this represented a socialist version of the Book of the Songs. And this Book of the Songs definitely represented the, uh, the, uh, the, the most um, ancient sort of a collection of, uh, of soundings by Chinese um, uh, populace uh, two or even 3,000 years ago. So definitely there is a classicist sort of root in this imagination of the new socialist paradigm of a literary imagination and the composition. So now we have seen the, uh, the uh, very, very interesting uh, dimensions of uh, how 
classes and references that were being used to facilitate uh, a, um, a socialist um, a, a cause. And one probably would wonder, these are really uh, conservative and uh, pre-modern references. Why did Mao and his, his cohorts were so enthusiastic, in, enthusiastic promoting uh, this kind of a poetic composition? Well, Mao uh, had always had a suspicion about the nature of a modern or modernist literature um, in the format of a May Force um, revolution. And he felt that modern literature was actually um, a kind of a legacy of, um, of capitalist um, imaginations and the capitalist importations to China. And he wanted to pr promote a kind of a poetry, a kind of a literature with a specific Chinese characteristics and therefore a historical allusions or necessary means for him to um, make a new intervention with uh, world literature. And here, I just wanted to share with you the, uh, the, uh, the so-called um, red flag songs um, 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 composed by uh, Chinese people. Uh, we don't know who they are, mostly anonymous um, uh, the, the poetry writers, but somehow a, po a poem such as uh, this one. Uh, the commune screens of pie up sky high, the members live like gods. Their pigs are huge and long, with the bodies as wide as the Pacific. The pig's back is a runaway, his ear an airport. So definitely, um, this is uh, almost like, a, sounds like a dog reel, but um, um, according to uh, some of the uh, poetry commentators and the critics at that time, uh, poems like uh, this one really um, uh, bring back uh, to mind how um, the Chinese people were, 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 were severing or celebrating their lives uh, uh, in, in the ancient times. At, as, if, at, as they were now. So definitely another kind of a paradoxical uh, sort, of, um, uh, sort of echoing here um, uh, can, be, um, can be thought about uh, by, by readers of our time. Nevertheless, I wanted to say that uh, 1958 was also a moment of a crisis. In that year, um, uh, a, a, a battle broke out uh, right um, um, uh, in, you know, in Taiwan Straits and the Tibet uprising was uh, coming along, was looming large, to say nothing of the fact that the Great Famine was definitely haunting all over China. And in, in the next three years, we would see more than, at least uh, more than uh, 30 million Chinese people perished as a result of this, uh, this um, Great Famine. A famine actually was uh, resulting from man-made disasters. Um, the great leap forward and so on and so forth. No matter what, it was um, under this kind of um, sort of um, historical circumstances, um, the scholar Chen Yingke um, came along to compose his own poetry and uh, to write about his own kind of a historical um, uh, studies. Chen Yingke is arguably the greatest historian of a modern China. And he came from a prestigious family background. And he, um, he graduated from Harvard University. And by the late 1940s, he was offered a teaching position at Oxford University, which he declined. After 1949, Chen Yingke decided to stay on the mainland, although he had options to go overseas. In just a couple of years, Chen Yingke was to come to, was to realize that uh, he probably made a, uh, uh, a mistaken uh, decision with regard to um, his own future. In the new region, in the, in the eras of so-called liberation, Chen Yingke found himself trapped in an environment in which everything was subject to censorship and a mutual surveillance. He could only turn his thoughts and the feeling into a heavily dense web of archaic references. His poetic encryption may bespeak a motivation of a self-protection, but a more compelling reason perhaps is that national and personal trials had led him to a different understanding of a literary agency and historical representation. Before 1949, Chen Yingke was an internationally well-known 
historian, particularly specializing in medieval Chinese social and historical and political dynamics. He paid special attention to the relationship between Han Chinese civilization and other non-Han Chinese civilizations around the Chinese territory. And his uh, scholarship extended even to areas such as uh, Central Asia and India. So by all means, this is um, one of the greatest scholars at the time. And nevertheless, he took a major um, a scholarly turn after 1949. Instead of focusing upon medieval studies, he now turned his attention to literature, not just the literature of the canonical kind, but literature of the popular strain. So that's really a very intriguing thing for us to think about. No matter what, as early as 1951, right after the movement of uh, the reform of the intellectuals at the time, Chen Yingke was already very, very sensitive to the new intellectual culture he was inhabiting. So even at that time, he was uh, composing a poem such as uh, um, Nan Tan, female impersonator. Um, this is, of course, um, a very, very sarcastic uh, a poem referring on surface the, um, the art of uh, impersonature, which was prevailing in traditional Chinese theater. But now Chen Yingke was using the metaphor or the image of the male dan or female impersonator to, uh, to, uh, to use this image uh, as a kind of a reference to those um, theatrical gestures as assumed by his uh, uh, fellow scholars and the colleagues who just uh, were either willing to or were succumbing to the uh, new strictures and dogmas of the new time. And he was uh, ridiculing all his colleagues and the fellow scholars uh, um, um, as nothing but female impersonators. So here, um, I quote from him, remaking a man, creating a woman, a wholly new demeanor, referring to the uh, total change of the ethos and the structure of feeling of the new time. The very essence of a theater was also the unmatched glory of the time past. I sigh that after such a romantic elan has ebbed and faded. It is a scholar who, against all odds, inherits its tradition. In other words, scholars are even more uh, despicable than female impersonators or actors in general in uh, acting out the most um, sort of um, decadent side of a society. Chen Yingke definitely was not um, welcomed by colleagues of this new regime. And uh, so much so, he uh, complained or sighed about his own fate in poems such as this one. My life hangs on. I let myself be the object of a ready scorn. As the only thing left for me to write is the praise of fair ladies. This refers to the shift, his uh, scholarly direction after 1949. And now he has put most of his emphasis on uh, writings by and about women. Women not from illustrious background, but women from um, obscure background or women from lower, so, uh, lower social strata. So this really is a very, very intriguing decision on his part that how come a, a famous medievalist wanted to uh, shift the focus of his uh, scholarship to a new terrain, mostly late imperial Chinese uh, literature and the Chinese theater at large. And also he wrote in such a way as to uh, subvert the traditional sort of a uh, discourse uh, warranting a so-called a solid scholarship. So two works being um, um, completed during this period, 1950s and early 1960s. The first one is his critique um, on a, uh, a prose metric narrative, Love in Two Lives, a, um, a, a very, very long narrative um, 
composed by a um, very ob obscure woman writer named Chen Duansheng. Now, we don't know too much about this lady, and, but somehow she left behind an extremely long narrative cycle in a Southern uh, prosmetic style. And Chen Yingke published in 1954 on Love in Two Lives, which was not allowed to be released in China, but somehow he managed to uh, um, produced the mimograph copies on his own and um, had these copies uh, in circulation overseas. So this was the beginning of his engagement with, uh, with literature and the classical literature of the obscure kind. But even more intriguing is the fact that after 1954, Chen Yingke spent 10 years working on the poetry and the poetic relationships uh, among these three figures, Chen Zilong, Liu Rushi, and the Qian Qian Yi. Mr. Chen and the Mr. Qian were very famous late Ming, early Qing loyalists. And Liu Rushi was known for her beauty and the talent and her chivalric spirit. Liu Rushi was uh, romantically um, involved uh, in a kind of um, um, the sort of the triangular relationship with Chen Zilong and the Qian Qian Yi. And after um, the, uh, the, the suicide of Chen Zilong for the cause of late mean loyalism, uh, Liu Rushi finally sort of ended up uh, with, um, living with Chen Qian Yi. But this is uh, really um, one of the most uh, traumatic um, episodes of late Ming loyalism. And Liu Rushi stood out as a legendary figure who um, embodied the spirit of a loyalist integrity and the feminine imagination of a culture which was in decline when the Manchus uh, were coming into China to take over, to, to, to take over the, uh, the, the whole traditional culture. So here we come to the factor of um, the red seed or the red bean. Um, this is a really a very, very interesting uh, moment um, for Chen Yingke to uh, invoke this uh, particular botanic object, the red seed. And this, uh, this uh, tiny, tiny uh, um, that object actually has a, uh, a story or a history of its own. So Chen Yingke described how in the, uh, in the uh, preface to this uh, extremely um, um, meticulous study of uh, Liu Rushi, uh, Chen Qian Yi, and uh, Chen Zilong, um, he described how, as, uh, as a youth, uh, he had read Chen Qian Yi's uh, um, poetry right, without any adequate understanding. At that time, uh, in the late Qing period, Chen Qian Yi's poetry was still kind of a kind of a, a forbidden object. Um, but during the war with Japan, now time shifted to late 1930s and the early 1940s. During this time, um, Chen Yingke bought just by accident from a Kunming book dealer. Uh, Kunming refers to the, uh, the wartime uh, site where um, many institutions uh, moved to. And he somehow just uh, came across a bookseller who promoted and eventually sold a red seed, Hongdou, supposedly from the garden of Chen Qian Yi and the Liu Rushi at the Changshou. Paying, he paid a hefty price for it. So one must wonder why a great scholar um, such as um, um, Chen Yingke would have bothered to pay attention to a tiny, tiny red seed during the war time. And just because this a tiny red seed was a, a purportedly from the uh, deserted of the garden of a Chen Qian Yi and the Liu Rushi. So there was a story involved in, in, in this a whole um, the purchase. And the Chen Yin Ke wrote, since I acquired the seed, 20 years have passed in a thrice. Although the seed is still kept hidden away in boxes, it is as if it exists. It does not. So the, the red seed was alone with the Chen Yingke from the, um, the Republican era to the era of a People's Republic of China for more than 20 years. And now in late 1950s, Chen Yingke suddenly wanted to, uh, to, 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 to take a look at the seed 
and the seed inspired him to, uh, to write a long narrative and a kind of a historical or historiographical study of uh, uh, Liu Ruxi in relation to the two gentlemen. So I quote, Chen Yinke said, I no longer look at it, but since then I have reread the writings of Chen Chen Yi, not merely to relieve, the, to, uh, to relieve old dreams, but uh, um, let my mind roam, but also to test the accent of my learning. So definitely there was something, um, something playful um, about the, the, uh, the intent of writing such a long narrative. He no longer just depend upon traditional meticulous and rigorous uh, historiographical uh, the, the rule in um, studying this, um, this relationship between Chen um, and the Liu and the Qian. Instead, he adopted a kind of a fictional narrative mode to uh, relate the story. And uh, still, the focus of today's lecture has to do with the uh, inspirational function of the Red Seed. And therefore, um, um, in, the, in the preface to uh, Liu Ruxi Bie Zhuan, or this biographical narrative of Liu Ruxi, uh, Chen Yinke composed a series of poems, all referring to the discovery uh, of this Red Seed. Through Kapo Ashes, the Red Seed of Kunming is still here. The loan of 20 years has waited till now to be fulfilled. In other words, Chen Yinke wrote this long historical narrative right upon this inspirational source of uh, the Red Seed. The Red Seed represented for him the, uh, the, uh, the, the comings and the goings of historical dynamics. It also represented for him this kind of a deep-seated emotional ties between Liu Ruxi and the two late Ming loyalists. But above all, this red seed also suggested to Chen Yinke the necessity of uh, political integrity. The red seed here symbolizes a, a whole range of um, so-called loyalist sentiments and it, in response to the changing circumstances, circumstances of the People's Republic of China. We all know that uh, this whole um, imagery of red seeds dates way back. This particular seed actually enjoyed its own kind of a genealogy. So it re really um, reminds us of the famous poem um, of Tang Dynasty, Wang Wei, seventh, seventh, and eighth century. Um, the, the poem titled Loin, Hong Dou Sheng Nan Guo, Chun Lai Fa Ji Zhi. I think this is a, a kind of a primary um, school textbook, uh, this kind of classic. We all started a, sort of our learning of traditional Chinese poetry with such a kind of a, sort of famous poems as a Hong Dou or Xiang Si. Right? There actually are um, some controversies about um, this, um, the nature of this, uh, this red seed or red bean. And the scholars have uh, argued about uh, exactly what kind of species it really is. It really is. Is this a plant? Is this a tree or whatever? But definitely just a, a footnote for everyone's uh, reference. And whatever, Chen Yinke spent 10 years writing um, this uh, biographical narrative about the Liu Ruxi in association with uh, Chen Chen Yi and Chen Zilong. Um, in Chinese characters, the total length of, um, of this narrative amounts to more than 800,000 characters. It's really very, very long narrative. And as I said, it doesn't follow the traditional, very rigorous kind of uh, scholarly discourse. Instead, this is a, a narrative with, uh, with a, kind of, um, a kind of mixture of styles mixtures of uh, in intended uh, uh, or implied uh, readerships. And then it has, um, it has a personal reminiscence about the bygone days. It has uh, his own imagination of how the three figures in question interacted with each other. It also um, has um, Chen Yinke's own philosophical thoughts about what history really means and so on and so forth. So no matter what, um, Chen Yinke came to the conclusion that um, maybe 
times comes and goes, right? Having seen uh, so much historical dynamics in his own study of a medieval and the later imperial Chinese histories. And the red being perhaps is the only token object which survives um, the ebbs and the flows of history and, and it registers the, the frailty of the human condition. So here I quote, white willows in front of the grave have been replaced with many times. The red seed left behind forever preserves spring in this world. Maybe this is a kind of a, a object that, uh, that really uh, sort of kindles and rekindles uh, um, our passion for understanding the past anew. And this new uh, so regime is not, is really not unlike the past or bygone uh, regimes or dynasties in terms of, um, of sort of chronicling and uh, registering uh, human sentiments, both great and uh, trivial, both um, epic and uh, lyrical. And, and in that connection, Chen Yingke proceeded to praise a woman such as, um, as Liu Rushi, who once upon a time was merely a courtesan um, um, in pleasure quarters in Southern China. But somehow she emerged to become a legendary lady, um, uh, making connections with the late Ming loyalists for the call for the for the cause of um, of a Ming loyalism, and the Chen Yingke found in a woman such as Liu Rushi the spirit of independence and the freedom of a thought. But for those who are aware of um, the dynamics of a Chinese um, political and the intellectual history in, um, in the Republican era, um, we surely understand the quote, spirit of independence and the freedom of a thought was actually um, taken from Chen Yingke's uh, um, commemoration of his um, colleague in the 1920s. And this, this person uh, is none other than Wang Guowei, one of the greatest philosophers and literary critics in 20th century China. And Wang Guowei drawn himself in, in 1927 in protest um, against the, uh, the volatile circumstances of the warlords um, takeover of, um, of uh, the whole China. So on surface, it seems kind of an unlikely kind of a juxtaposition between Wang Guowei on the one hand and the Liu Rushi on the other hand. But somehow Chen Yingke found in this late Ming woman uh, who um, lived about the 300 years um, uh, before um, the, uh, the passing or the drowning of Wang Guowei, some kind of imaginary, imagined kindred, kindred spirit um, between the two figures. And he actually even uh, extended his uh, survey of this uh, genealogy of a spirit of independence freedom of a thought to his uh, reading of a Chen Duansheng's uh, uh, prose metric narrative, uh, Love in Two Lives. In other words, he found in the two women figures who otherwise had already been obscured by memory and the historical records, uh, uh, he found in them something uh, very, very inspiring in the new time of the People's Republic of China. And through the, uh, the invocation of a Wang Guowei's case, um, the, 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 the drawing of a Wang Guowei, he sort of, uh, sort of map out a, a new kind of um, sort of um, uh, that, uh, terrain uh, speaking to the, uh, the whole dimension of uh, Chinese integrity, uh, a Chinese uh, sort of, um, sort of um, an understanding of the past in relation to the present. So here, again, again, we are amazed by the way Chen Yingke started with the invocation of a red seed, a red bean, um, which was um, supposedly uh, found in the garden of um, the late Ming courtesan and her beloved, Mr. Chen Qingyi. And then uh, over the uh, 300, the, the time span of more than 300 years, uh, this uh, red seed traveled through the, the tunnel of time to the, the moment of the Maoist China. 
and Chen Yingke obviously was thinking of his own position in relation to the two ladies in discussion. And he felt ironic about his own kind of a new enterprise, which seems to be frivolous, which seems to be playful. He was merely doing some kind of literary studies of two obscure women. And nevertheless, he concluded his um, biography of Liu Ruxi with a line like this one. I only quote the last two lines, unabashedly crying for the bygone ones, leaving this as a gift for the ones to come. So here, this particular this refers, of course, to the long narrative of, uh, about the biography of Liu Ruxi and Chen Qingyi and Chen Zilong. But on the other hand, we also understand this this also refers to the legendary and the mysterious uh, Red Seed, which seems to um, encapsulate all the trauma and the pathos of not only the late Ming loyalists, but also post-Republican intellectuals such as Chen Yingke. So here, again, we are witnessing the power of a poetic reference or poetic um, evocation. And this kind of um, reference, that of course, does not um, uh, limit itself merely to the uh, kind of a legendary object such as the Red Seed from 300 years ago. Um, but nevertheless, uh, overall, Chen Yingke wanted to talk about uh, his own new vision of what history is all about. History is really a history of the heart. History does not necessarily refer to only the, 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 the villains, the giants, um, the politically and, and romantically and so on and so forth. History is that which really speaks to the deepest niche of one's heart and mind. And above all, for Chen Yingke, this kind of a history of the heart is none other than the crystallization of uh, literary poetry in form. So where history collapses, poetry arises. So we cite Huang Zhongxi's uh, famous uh, um, phrase, another late Ming loyalist. And for Chen Yingke, by revisiting the uh, so-called heart of a history of the bygone ages, he actually is invoking a kind of a parallel reading of the past and the present. And the Red Seed here serves as a motif of a poetic evocation that links people of a different times, different societies, different sentiments. And of course, it, this Red Seed offers a new kind of a reading of the politics of a contemporary China um, in the late 1950s. Now I move to the fourth figure of today's lecture. And this person is named Nie Ganu. As I mentioned earlier on, he joined the Chinese communist activities as early as the late 1920s. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, he was definitely one of the active uh, participants of the great cause of a revolution. But by mid 1950s, Nie Ganu found himself to be named as a counter revolutionary in one of Mao's purges against uh, his um, um, uh, erstwhile allies or fellow travelers. As a result, in 1958, Nie Ganu was exiled to northern Manchuria, um, supposedly the most desolate um, area at that time for re education. So Nie Ganu definitely um, um, had a very, very um, uh, tough life in Northern Manchuria. The winter was, uh, was cold, the land was desolate, and all the hard labor in the name of a re-education was wearing him out. Nevertheless, Nie Ganu, during this time of hardship uh, and fortitude, was able to, uh, to, to come up with a, uh, a, a, a series of, uh, of uh, poems, which he eventually put together as a small collection in memory of his uh, years of re-education or exile. I found one particularly intriguing, sort of in relation to the subject matter of today's lecture, that is Nie Gan Nu's description of how he 
uh, one day was uh, peeling potatoes, but by accident, uh, um, um, he, uh, he hurt his, uh, his finger. So this is a really, uh, uh, in a way, in terms of su subject matter, a very low broad kind of approach to everyday life practice uh, uh, in, Northern, or, uh, in Northern China. Um, Xiao Tu Di Shang Shou. Uh, um, I would just read the English part um, of, the, of, of this poem, the English translation of this poem. There are no pits or sprouts on the potatoes, but my frantic eyes follow with a busy knife. Who could see the two or three spots of blood? The 60 year olds both fall on empty ears. I wish to plant the red seed in the far north. It is a difficult to build China with bare hands. It is too embarrassing to speak aloud such a bold words. This is a small read, actually should be read, offering to the country. So here you can see um, the, uh, the reference to dou. Right? This is a really a commonplace uh, sort of peasant food, not uh, potatoes. But somehow, um, Nie Gan Nu was, uh, was, uh, was uh, deliberately making um, a reference to Hong Dou, to, to Red Seed. So th this, is, this is a really kind of unlikely juxtaposition, right? And uh, he found the blood stain on, 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 on the top of the, 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 the potatoes, stained, which nevertheless remind him of uh, the redness associated with, with the Red Seed. And we know by a, a, another or a further association, red seed refers to xiangsi or longing or romantic longing. But what was the object for Nie Ganu's romantic longing at this difficult time of his exile? Well, according to him, this longing may be referring to his beloved one uh, in Beijing or somewhere else. But particularly, most likely, um, this loin refers to his patriotic thought. He remains still uh, someone thinking of his own country, thinking of his own patriotic cause. But what, what does it mean? It really um, matters not that much, given his uh, um, identity as an exile, as a kind of counter-revolutionary member of, uh, of the clique against uh, the Chinese communist revolutionary um, uh, campaign or agenda. So here, Nie Gan Nu was, uh, was writing in such a way as either to express his own melancholy or melancho melancholic thought, right? Which ends up nowhere, but only with the, 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 Fortuit, gratuitous action of peeling potatoes, or he actually find in this potatoes uh, an imagery of uh, the seed of a loin, romantic loin. Whether he's a serious about the whole comparison or juxtaposition, or he's being sarcastic, not only sarcastic about his own status in this, uh, in this time, 1958, 1959, but also sarcastic about the whole nationalist agenda for which he had already uh, contributed so much uh, of his own energy and life, and yet to no avail. So basically, this is a really a very um, a kind of ironic play with the, uh, the conventional formula of, um, of a traditional classicist uh, style of a, of a poem. It really, um, um, the bring the grassroots experience and, ex and, and, and imagination to bear upon a kind of um, um, a kind of um, hyperbolic agenda called a revolution or socialism or the nation or whatever. But everything, all these feelings, all these sentiments, walk down to this simple and unsuccessful action of appealing potatoes, and um, potatoes above all are not red seeds. So here, one may even say, by writing such a kind of poem, Nie Gan Nu actually deconstructs the overall genealogy of a red seed imagination.
Li Ganlu wrote some other poems later in his um, in his years. He actually um, uh, uh, suffered a lot during the Cultural Revolution period, and he was not rehabilitated till after the revolution was over. But looking back at um, his own adventures, lifelong adventures from uh, Southeast Asia to Bei Da Huang or Manchuria, um, he, um, he sighed. Um, I quote the last two lines, examining my entire life, I have no other shortcomings, except that I didn't perceive my mediocrity until I got old. So basically, this is a really a kind of a recollection of the past with a sigh, a gratuitous sigh that uh, all this rev revolutionary sentiment uh, now all gone, all evaporated into nothing. So there is a sort of tender, mild, kind of romantic, kind of a, a sort of melancholia to speak of. But above all, Nia Ganu in his final years um, um, come to uh, terms with um, his own revolutionary memory uh, only in a kind of a mild, mild, um, a playful, but a sort of a deconstructive mode. Now, conclusion. I wanted to say with four examples, one is a kind of a Mao's kind of a poem, it's a traditional, in the, tradi in the tradition of, a, of an imperial poetry. And the, the, the red flag poems or poetry in the tradition of the socialist uh, um, version of a Shi Jing or Book of Songs. And the Chen Ying Ke, an elite scholars um, sort of heavily encrypted the evocation of his own sentiment vis-a-vis 1950s cultural politics. And the Nia Ganu's sarcastic, lyrical sort of recollection of his life in, in, in down and trodden. So all different kinds of a forms of a poetic soundings, but all inspired in one way or another by classicist sort of um, um, the, the inventory of a poetry genres and the modes. So basically I'm talking about uh, the mutual implication, if not necessarily mutual um, illumination between the uh, pre-modern modes of a poetic um, um, compositions and the very up-to-date contemporary kind of, um, sort of um, um, witness, witness, witnessing or testimonial expression of um, life under um, the socialist uh, um, leadership. So to conclude, I wanted to argue that the complex implications of a modern classical style of Chinese poetry have yet to be carefully studied. Indeed, the genre perhaps want to rethink the multiple strains in the genesis um, uh, and the development of a Chinese literary modernization. It calls attention to issues ranging from the mutual implications between tradition and the modernity to the politics of a cultural axiology and the plotting of a history and a temporality. More importantly, through reading classical style poetry in the new century, we are compelled to contemplate again the condition of a newness underlining modern Chinese literary culture. It touches upon a spectrum of the themes such as a reinterpretation of a classicist literary thought, the fashioning of literary subjectivities, the politics of archaism in the classicist intervention with history. Finally, I argue, we have yet to seriously examine classical or classicist style of Chinese um, literature from the modern perspective. And we want to see modern Chinese literature as a site of contestations where China coped with, with not only Western and the Japanese importations, but also her own legacies. We have spent too much time talking about Chinese literary modernities as a kind of a China's reception of or reaction to non-Chinese uh, um, sources, Western, Japanese, and so, so on and so forth. But when coming to Chinese literary history, we still tend to accept the easy dichotomy of a modernity versus a tradition. We tend to ignore the fact that the tradition is not a great chain of a being that suddenly came to a halt at the threshold of modernity, any more than a succession of inventions 
anti-inventions, re-inventions, and non-inventions that developed well into modern times. So whether inheriting or disinheriting traditional resources, the present is intimately intertwined with the past in its ingenious appropriations or impassioned negotiation. So I believe classicism is definitely a new source of inspiration in our rethinking of the meaning of a Chinese modernity and a post-modernity. And therefore, I really appreciated this opportunity to share my personal opinions with everybody. And I want to thank you for your listening. Thank you. It's a pity that thank you very much, Professor David Wang. We had a this is a very erudite and extremely insightful talk. I believe we have all learned、uh, a lot from the talk, and I see many、uh, virtual applauses <laughs> in the audience. So I would ask you to、uh, use the reaction button on the bottom lower right and click raise hand. To raise your virtual hand in case you have any questions, or simply、uh, type "I have a question" if you are not clear how to use this function. Unfortunately,、uh, Professor Astrid Earl, my colleague in English literature studies, and also a prominent student of、uh, to really a, a very important figure in memory studies in Germany, have、uh, have to leave at five o'clock. But she has a question for you, David. <laughs> So she and she asks me to ask this question. So she, as she writes,、um, I find it interesting how the red flag ballads, Hong Qi Ge Yao, reference to the poems of three thousand years ago, and other poems reference to the poems from the seventeenth or eighteenth century, or maybe earlier. So is classicism a collective singular for many different old times? Or it should it be a、uh, plural? <laughs> so this is her question. Um, should I answer right away? Yeah. Yes, please. Definitely. Um, I um I couldn't agree with、uh, this um this point. That it, for me, classicism is not a singular monolithic articulation of a poetic tradition. Right. That's a really a streamlined. Um, and actually, a kind of very modernist kind of、um, sort of、um, sort of ideology, right? To to streamline everything into one linear and progressive sequence of、um, periods, of times, and so on and so forth. Instead, by classicism, I wanted to、um, call attention to the fact that、um, in pre-modern times, not just only in, in the case of China, but also in Germanic traditions and so forth, there are many traditions. There are many times. There are many, many different kinds of interventions with traditions, either positive or negative. So that's why I thought that 1958 marked a kind of、um, peculiar moment of、um, uh, ch modernist Chinese literature. And 1958, may I suggest um, um, that um, was the, the the eve of the、uh, of the tense.、Uh, Um, uh, the, the year of the founding, after the founding of the People's、um, New Republic of China, at this juncture,、uh, instead of、uh, sort of celebrating、um, the so-called new form, Xin Shi or new poetry,、um, the nation actually was、uh, promoting different kinds of、uh, classicist、uh, experimentations with、uh, traditional modes of、uh, poetry. I think that's very very interesting. But somehow, in the case of a German Mao, of course,、um, um, the idea to foreground his nineteen poems in English, English translation, of course, is a very sort of a global campaign、uh, on behalf of his literary talent.、Um, uh, I mean, that was definitely the、uh, the 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 primary goal of、um, of literature propaganda at the time. In the meantime, I just wanted to juxtapose、uh, Mao's poetry with the so-called people's、uh, composition of folk songs,、uh, um, almost at the same time, simultaneously, right?、Um, as a kind of、um, really a, a kind of intriguing sort of a collaboration at the time.
who are the people? Were they really capable of composing um, poems um, reminiscent of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the ethos, the themes of um, poems that supposedly produced 3,000 years ago? Basically, it's, uh, it's really not the case. Right. This is really a kind of a manufactured kind of um, composition, um, uh, sort of echoing the national call for the populist kind of um, sort of imagination of the most recent uh, socialist uh, um, production. So there was a, um, a controversy about the true nature of the so-called red flag uh, poems. I think my colleague, Professor Tian Xiaofei, has written something to this effect. My point, however, is still uh, to recognize um, the existence of such a kind of poetic um, uh, composition. And, uh, and also the, uh, the, the, the sheer imagination that uh, the past and the present can coexist, can actually inspire us um, uh, in, sense, in the sense of not necessarily a nearly linear progression of a temporality in the socialist mode. But from our point of view, this kind of a strange juxtaposition, 1958, 1959, Mao's poem, uh, Chen Yinke's poems, and, and the, the red flag poems and so, so forth, actually um, tells us a different kind of story. That is how untimely the uh, composition and the, uh, really it is, right? And this, we, we want to look into the fissures, the, the friction, the, uh, the strange um, um, the dialogue, no dialogue among all these uh, revivals of uh, pre-modern genres. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Uh, if not at this moment, I will take the chance to ask my own question. Actually, I have two questions. One is I found it intriguing at the end, Liu Yazi had a guest appearance, right, in Ye Ganu's uh, poem written in his 80s. And for those of you who are not familiar with who Liu Yazi was, Liu Yazi was one of the most famous uh, classical style poets in the Republican era. And he was uh, he was a, the so prominent member of the Kuomintang left, uh, but he passionately embraced the communist victory. I actually wrote a short article, uh, two articles on Liu Yaz. A short one is on his promotion of Chairman Mao as a new poet. And uh, so it's kind of intriguing that in his relation with Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong underwent to kind of strange twist after the People's Republic because Liu Yazi really thought he and all the Kuomintang left, the intellectuals he represented, would find a democratic new leader in Mao Zedong and was eventually disappointed. So I just wonder by saying in Sao Fei Yazi, Xian Zhang Shi, it is no longer the time when, when Liu Yazi presented his poem to Chairman Mao, which moment Lian Ganu was referring to? Because Liu Yazi wrote many poems for Chairman Mao. At the beginning, it was more like praise, but he also wrote poems of complaint. We know that Mao Zedong wrote, Lao Sao Man Fu Fang Chang Duan, Feng Wu Chang Yi Fang Yan Liang, please do not growl so much, your, your intestines could break. It's kind of menacing reply in a, in a, in a, in a, in a form of joke, precisely to a poem that Liu Yazi wrote. As a, as a poem of complaint or remonstration, right? So did yeah. Nye Ganu refer to Liu Yazi's poem of praise or his poem of, uh, of critique? Yes, and um, my comment is on this is that, of course, we have to, uh, to know um, uh, who Liu Yazi really is, right? And mm -hmm. he um, actually um, was already very, very active in 19 teens as a one of the founders of uh, the Southern or South Society, Nan Shu, mm -hmm. the largest um, clique of um, modern day classicist poets. And of course, uh, at the very beginning of his career, Liu Yazi was well known for his uh, engagement with the revolution. But then, as you pointed out, uh, Zhi Yi, 1949 marked this uh, remarkable um, sort of um, uh, shift um, of Liu Yazi's um, uh, platform, right? 
uh, he didn't just merely write poems celebrating revolution as such. He wrote poems celebrating the leader of the revolution, uh, Mao Zedong. And um, actually, uh, the literary history of um, the People's Republic of China um, actually opened with the exchange um, of poems between mm -hmm. the national leader and the Liu Yazi. So definitely, this figure uh, cast a very large profile at the very, very beginning moment of our time. And eventually, Mao Zedong, of course, he, he put up with some old-fashioned scholars such as Liu Yazi, and he, he didn't actually see um, too much harm on, on a, a, a poet like Liu Yazi could cause um, to this uh, new nation. Nevertheless, um, he uh, sort of um, wanted to cultivate this sentiment of a poetic exchange in a classicist style as if he meant to carry on the tradition of imperial, imperial court poetry. So very, very um, ambiguous um, uh, political motivations behind the scene. And uh, we can no longer really uh, tease out uh, um, which is which, whether Liu Yazi was wholeheartedly uh, writing for the, uh, the chairman and the new nation, or he was still carrying on his own style of a kind of a traditional uh, poet critiquing um, contemporary politics. On, on that note, I probably should also add the figure Guo Mo Ruo, uh, another figure who was good at both classic style of poetry and the modernist style of poetry, a kind of a literary acolyte, definitely um, uh, in the new era. So the uh, the, uh, the 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 connections among these poets, new or old style poets, uh, is really a um, a, a um, very important subject for our understanding of the cultural politics of um, Mao's China. And I have to say, we haven't done enough along this line because more often than not, we take this um, classic style poetry merely as a kind of a decoration, merely as a kind of ornament in relation to the literary imagination and the political imagination of the new time. My point, however, is that if a literature or particularly poetry constitute the foundational imagination of the state, the dynasty, or the nation as such, this kind of continued invocation of a classic style Chinese poetry is very much politically suggestive. And one can actually discern a lot of clues um, among the poems um, exchanged between Liu Yazi, Guo Mo Ruo, Mao Zedong, and many, many other contemporary political figures and the literati. Right? So by that standard, um, Chen Yinke's poems and uh, Nie Gan Nu's poems occupied only a marginal stance because there is a huge quantity of uh, socialist style um, imperial court poetry which actually is a great treasure for us if we, we can actually um, um, stand this, uh, this uh, uh, incredibly fancy wording and, uh, and, uh, and the cliched and the songs of a celebratory mood and so on. I think that's a treasure of, um, it's kind of archival source for our understanding of, the, of the, how this culture of China was being reconstructed in um, the socialist era. Thank you for the wonderful answer and very elaborate. I, now we have some uh, questions from the audience, but just to, to make sure that you understand my point, you don't have to type your full question in the chat. You can actually ask your question. So I will first ask Jin Huai Fang to ask your question. Please. Um, this is a good question. Um, um, uh, I, I don't know, this is a Professor Jin or whatever. Uh, do you think Yang Jiang's the six chapters from my life done under is also one way of writing by using Chinese classicism, uh, say imitation of a Fu Sheng Liu Ji? I thank you for this question. The answer, of course, is definitely yes. This is a, a great, great example illustrating how classist uh, on the style, discourse, and imagination uh, could be brought back in the 1980s to bear upon the unspeakable circumstances and the consequences of the great cultural revolution. 
when modernist literature failed to articulate the uh, unspeakable and unrepresentable suffering and absurdities of a time, classical literature or classicist imagination happened to sort of uh, take us through this tunnel of time to a different time, to a different space, so as to give us a kind of create some kind of imaginary uh, space, an uh, imaginary um, sort of platform on which we can rethink and reevaluate the, um, the, the lessons we had been through just, uh, just like uh, the, the, the Great Cultural Revolution. So Fu Sheng Liu Ji definitely uh, was uh, the source of uh, inspiration of uh, Yang, uh, Yang Jiang's recollection of, um, of uh, her uh, cadre school years. And uh, uh, this is something I love. And I've always uh, taught this um, two texts side by side in my class. And the uh, students could immediately understand why uh, we meant classicist literature is the most avant-garde and the most up-to-date. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, I think the next question from Shan Chen Zhi. Uh, Chen Zhi, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Oh, the question is, uh, how shall we, uh, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, uh, so my question is that, uh, how shall we um, consider the relation between the Yang Man Xi and the classic Chinese opera uh, in, in our history? And it seems that the new, newness has lost connection to its traditions concerning this type of art form. Um, yes, thank you very much for this question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can actually uh, offer two answers. The first answer is a very cynical one. I couldn't agree with you more that um, uh, Yang Ban Xi model theater or model play um, uh, was an ingenious a hodgepodge, right? This is a really a kind of weird mixture of a little bit of everything um, uh, from different sources of a, a theatrical tradition actually worldwide. Um, so not just merely, uh, modern and the pre-modern Chinese theatrical traditions, but also traditions drawn from other sources. And uh, Zhang Qing and her followers uh, were, were so imaginative and so uh, ambitious that they want to uh, reform um, the whole tradition of the Chinese theater once and for, for all. And th their solution, of course, to, to throw a little bit of everything into their huge uh, sort of product. Uh, the result is something um, I would have to say something um, uh, that is um, quite eye-opening, particularly for, for, for Western audience. I think um, uh, the, uh, when I am teaching Yang Ban Xi in, in my class, my students always laugh, always feel intrigued, feel uh, weird, or, or, and so on and so forth. But we should keep in mind that during the Cultural Revolution period, the Yang Ban Xi um, was, uh, was uh, not only to be watched, but also to be saluted. and. Uh, emulated by the audience. So, so this is, again, even in terms of the basic rationale, I think it couldn't be more uh, didactic, couldn't be more pedagogical, or for that matter, couldn't be more Confucian in the negative sense. So in that sense, I, I personally feel very, um, very cynical, of course, about this whole production. But the, the, the genuine question, however, embedded in your um, very, very stimulating um, um, question is that um, whether, this is a, can, a, can, whether this can be understood as a part of the classicist tradition uh, I am uh, thinking about or negotiating, my answer actually perhaps is, uh, is a positive. Yes, I think Yang Ban Xi, um, however weird, however, for me, unsuccessful, as a kind of an intervention with the tradition has to be understood as a kind of, um, as a kind of um, highly um, polemical and imagination, uh, a polemical and imaginative uh, sort, of, um, sort of a reinvention of the past. For good and for ill, you just have to understand it as a part of uh, the national legacy of Maoist China. And that's what I thought at the very beginning of my lecture, um, that uh, classicism as a new topic of literary inquiry doesn't refer only to the select phenomena we all appreciate as uh, literary connoisseurs or 
um, our literature lovers. But the classicism also refers to probably not so pleasant and not so productive aspects of the cultural and the literary production throughout the modern times. And, the, and, 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 and on that note, I think Yang Ban Xi is a very good case in point. Um, whether it's new or not, uh, it really is subject to debate. And uh, we do find a lot of uh, not so new elements uh, uh, in the production, particularly for me, I would say ideologically, it couldn't be more conventional. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, David. That's a wonderful comment. Uh, it really propels me <laughs> very reluctantly <laughs> to think if aside from the Maoist iconoclasm, we can also say there is a Maoist classicism. <laughs> So, which for me as a, as a poetry person, of course, is very unpleasant to <laughs> premeditate upon, but maybe we have to reluctantly, reluctantly consider this kind of hybridity of uh, classicism and modernism and socialist realism under, uh, in the Mao era. And I was over, will also take this quest, chance to ask my second question, which is about the Red Sea per se. I wonder how important is this physical presence of this Red Sea, as well as the hefty price that Chen Yinke did not forget to mention that he paid for it <laughs> matters <laughs> for this kind of cultural nostalgia or connection, right? Because this is a, a Red Sea, I think you can, buy it anyway, it doesn't have to be from the garden of uh, Qian Qian Yi and Liu, Liu Rushi. And the, and the bookseller, frankly, could have simply uh, preyed upon his, his naivete, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a truly a, a very, very um, provocative question for me because it touches upon not only uh, the question of uh, literary invocation, right? Uh, basically, uh, the, uh, the, the presence of this uh, botanic uh, object, red seed, that, that's, uh, that really uh, facilitated the traditional uh, poetic function, um, xing, right? Or bi, a kind of a motif or invocation, right? Um, so in that sense, uh, Chen Yinke actually was, uh, was following a good old tradition, right? You, you refer to some thing, some object, and through which you actually uh, um, uh, uh, elaborate um, uh, your own chain of the thoughts uh, uh, regarding many, many um, uh, subjects and the matters and the sentiments, right? But the question is interesting to me because you mentioned uh, the fact of a hefty price and also about uh, the, uh, the physical site uh, a, a red seed um, um, supposedly um, uh, collected from the uh, the deserted the garden of uh, Chen, uh, Chen uh, not Chen Zilong, but Liu Rushi and the Chen Chen Yi and so on and so forth. So that really touches upon the aspect of a material history, right? And we have to understand uh, the time was 1939. And uh, Chen Yinke was a, was, a, was a refugee, right? Um, which was, a, was, a, was taking shelter in Southwestern China. And financially, he was really under um, enormous uh, pressure. And yet he was willing to pay this uh, hefty price for this uh, legendary red seed, supposedly from this, uh, this, uh, this garden, which existed uh, 300 years before, right? So here, I, I think the, uh, the overall story is much more important than this mere fact that there is a thing we call the red seed, right? To, to, th to talk about or think of. So this is a, where I also um, wanted to, to highlight uh, the, uh, the uh, scholarly turn of a Chen Yinke's uh, engagement, because uh, more and more in reading along um, uh, his works during the 1950s, you see he became more and more relaxed and more and more free of, uh, in, in terms of imagination. I mean, there, 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 I would say there, there, there must be a red seed. Whether this red seed really functioned in such a way as to, to inspire uh, Chen Yinke to write about Liu Rushi and so on and so forth, that remains to be debated, right? So the whole sort of circulation of, um, of literary images, right? Um, material and non-material, and also um, uh, fictive 
and the historically uh, verifiable. I, I think a lot of a question can be raised from here. Um, the fact that also has to do with that uh, Chen Yingke uh, coming from a prestigious, prestigious family suffering from this long sort of residue uh, sentiment of a Qing loyalism. I think, I think everything has, be, has to be brought together. And then of course, everyone, everything um, uh, is being projected the, onto the physical presence of this red seed. And all of a sudden, you have this almost like uh, what uh, what uh, what Benjamin would uh, would have argued about. This is a sudden burst or sudden surge of a kind of a historical imagination in response to historical memory. I think Chen Yingke occupied that very very sensitive point of this kind of a historical encounter, either in literary terms or in in historical terms. I think that's why I th this this particular red seed becomes such a kind of an important a token of our understanding of, of his imagination of the past. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's such a potent moment. The text, memory, and object just intertwined in that moment when he purchased the red seat <laughs> and the logic of capitalism, right? I was wondering right. Right. what if the bookseller just gave it to him because it's famous chain. Oh. <laughs> Would it still have meant so much? <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Ming Takui, please. Yes, Professor Wang. I mean, hi. Hey, I am, Ted. Hello. I, I'm so intrigued by the talk. It's really fascinating. I actually, my question is somehow related to Ji's question. I mean, just then. I mean, it's a it's a really nice talk, and I think the object, the red seat itself, is a particularly, I mean, poignant, I mean, object there because it's a very it it's all starts from there. It's, I mean, all the memories and all the histories. Um, one thing that I think, I mean, might be related to this discussion is that, I mean, because in 1934, I remember reading, there is a discussion about the Changshou Hongdou. So there's a debate basically about, uh, is the Red Sea itself is uh, from Changshou. So there's like a huge debate and all the different articles trying to write about that <laughs> event and, Right about the 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 the, the authenticity of, 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 of that 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 red seed. I mean, is it really from the Tian Jia Garden? Uh, I, and that itself is quite interesting because that debate has become a a, a collection itself. And I, I was just thinking sometimes because that collection itself in the preface, the author, I mean, the editor, claimed that I mean they are trying to uh, move from the discussion of Xiangsi to Kaozheng, to talk about more <laughs> evidential scholarship. So we're not talking about all the Xiangsi anymore. So in some ways, it's actually, I think, points to a lot of questions that have been asked, I mean, today, that how do we think about what is classicism? And I mean, it's, I mean, hybridity with modernity in, in many ways. Like, what, what are we trying to go against with? I mean, when we define what is traditional or what is, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis modern. So I'm just curious, I mean, for Wang when because uh, now I think, I mean, this discussion seems to me that it's more about form and content and uh, emotions. Are there any ways, I mean, how do you envision uh, we approach this question about modernity and, and traditional? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a huge question. I'm not sure I can really answer in full. But first of all, of course, uh, this whole debate about what this uh, Red Sea is all about, right? <laughs> I, I had a tremendous fun reading all this evidential uh, uh, things about to identify whether this is a tree, this is a plan, this is imagination, or and the, okay, the price issue and so on and so forth, right? I mean, that's a, that's a part of a, that's a part of a scholarship, of course, and of course, that's a part of a scholarship, if you will, sort of sustaining the tradition of uh, evidential um, sort of a scholarship, Kao Zheng Xue, right? That's a part of the it's kind of a I mean Chinese um, uh, scholarly humanities, but I think the the the, the second part of the question has to do um, with um, with modernity versus tradition. I think that's the. The, the main point I was trying to make with references to four uh, examples. Uh, my, my answer perhaps is that um, just as much as we don't have only one tradition, right? We don't have one modernity either. I think the, uh, we, we ought to open up this kind of a temporal horizon 
uh, at this juncture of, uh, of this post-socialist and postmodernist, and if you will, postmodernist uh, sort of engagement with literature and arts in general. And for example, one joke I would like to crack to my students is that, that uh, don't call me a, uh, a, a specialist in modernism anymore because in, in, the, in the 21st century, I'm already a traditionalist because for my current crop of students, um, uh, this David Wong from 20th century, how could he dare describing himself a, a modern or postmodernist? It's over, right? So in other words, my answer to you is that modernity and modernism has to be historicized in the first place when we come to a terms with the question of a modernity and or versus a tradition. Just think about when Buddhism was introduced to China 2000 years ago. Could we say that was a very modern period when all the conceptual framework, epistemological framework of a traditional or China or pre-Han or even pre-Qing China, all of a sudden toppled in response to this new thing we call the Buddhism, right? Or Tang Dynasty or this Ming Qing moment. So in that sense, if we are um, treating modernity with quotation marks as a kind of a continued reinvention of our shared cultural memory, modernity has happened many times already in our history. The same applies to our understanding of a classicism or tradition. I think um, really, uh, it, 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 for me, it's not just merely a kind of a sort of, um, sort of historical engagement with our multiple legacies. Also, it refers to a kind of methodolo methodological sort of um, intervention or invention by calling back um, classicism so that we actually are putting the modern or the postmodern in a new perspective. And above all, um, I think um, against the, uh, the, the modernist um, strategy of, 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 a, of a sequ sequencing everything, uh, the sort of making a streamline uh, of everything. I wanted to see almost in a kind of um, a Foucauldian archeological perspective. I want to see history as a kind of a multiple layer uh, sentimentation of a different kind of a sentiment, different kind of thrusts, different kind of ideologies, and so on and so forth, continuously uh, in contestation. And so the invocation of a classicism offers only a, a, new, a new sort of entry point to this uh, modernity or modern, which seems a bit outdated or stale. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this ex very extensive and extremely inspiring answer. Uh, I know this is already time, but I would like to take this chance and add my own uh, little thought on this issue. Because when I present the idea of the Sinophone classicism, especially in Germany to German scholars, the question I encounter most often is, what do you mean by classicism? Because for German scholars, classicism means the veneration of Greek and Roman traditions, right? But I think just like like in the in the US, in the States, especially in grand institutions like Harvard and Princeton, there's a huge debate on the uh, white supremacist legacy or the colonial legacy of classical studies. The answer, I think, is not to close down the departments of classical studies, but to expand them to include the study of other classical traditions and to give equal acknowledgement of every tradition, every classical tradition is different and may have a different temporal referential dimension as well. So in the case of the Chinese classical traditions, maybe the most important temporal reference is this encounter with Western modernity. And in, on, in that aspect, maybe we also need to propose a certain study of global classicisms, just like we are studying global modernisms. That's right. So thank you so much for this insightful talk once again, and for everyone who has been staying with this talk, maybe twice already, especially some listeners from Taiwan, because of this very strange winter time in Germany. Now this is already post midnight in Taiwan. So thank you so much for staying with us. And uh, I hope because this is an ongoing project, if you have any comments or thoughts, please write us emails. Uh, 
together. And we, I hope this is kind of collective brain storming project moving to the future and not simply staying with one lecture and i hope to see you more often in the future oh we have a question from professor Riemenschnitter. so beata do we still have time yes i sorry i overlooked uh, andrea's uh, message andrea are you still there Oh, yes, please. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Rimesh Nitter from okay. Zurich. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sorry to delay the, the, the end of the talk, but it is such a fascinating lecture and such a wonderful opportunity. So I'm, I was wondering, I was following you with the magic red bean or red seed. And I thought about, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the problem of, as you put it also, the problem of uh, periodization. So how do you periodize, periodize these, these classicisms? Are we now in a new period of classicism or is it not a classicism when it becomes a specter? I, I was wondering about these uh, issues in relation to um, environmental uh, literature and uh, especially the return to century poetry and art. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I can, uh, if I can really answer this question, but this is a most inspiring. Indeed, as you pointed out, um, the uh, return of uh, Shanshui paintings and the poetry represented a, a kind of a new awareness of the Chinese environment and the poetic imagination. This is something new. I mean, um, of course, we can always talk about how pre-moderns thought about the environment, the intelligence and so forth, but definitely uh, this uh, whole environmentalist discourse um, is something uh, we are all concerned about in our time, right? So in that sense, um, uh, I think classicism is being introduced uh, almost like a, uh, like a catalyst. I mean, it's really a triggered yet another strain of a, uh, another a, a, a train of thoughts um, in relation to the way the ancient thought about the nature and the ecology and so on and so forth, and the way we are com coping with uh, the change of circumstances of ecology and environment and our time. So here, I would suggest that uh, classicism, particularly in this case, um, um, uh, paintings and, uh, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, sort of ornamental arts uh, um, um, actually um, um, sort of um, the triggers a, a, a cluster of associations taking us uh, again back to a different historical moments and come to understand the different reactions to ecologies and environment. And definitely um, um, the, 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 the landscape of uh, paintings and, and the poetry um, once upon a time uh, occupied the major stage of poetic uh, presentations. And now I believe uh, the newer generation of a classicist of poet, a poet uh, could take upon uh, where the whole sort of um, um, uh, idea was uh, being left off at one moment and to invent new ones. And that won't be the same. And so I think a repetition and the difference always intertwined with each other. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And David is a landscape painter himself. <laughs> But, so I have a, a message from an audience asking if there's going to be a published recording that you can access later. Indeed, we're going to make a recording of the talk and put it on the FKH uh, IAS Human in the Humanities uh, YouTube channel. So, and if you are registered uh, for the for the talk, you're going to receive the link later. And I will also take the chance to remind you that on November 26, Yang Lian. Uh, a Friday, Yang Lian would give his talk on A Power Built Downward, the creative transformation of Chinese classical lyric aesthetics. So if you happen to live around Frankfurt, you're welcome to come to the presents uh, lecture yourself, well, followed by a reception. And if you do not live in Frankfurt, you're welcome to, to follow the online Zoom link again. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you in particular, David, for this talk. And we hope to, I'm looking forward to our future discussions on, on, on these so many related topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.